and I'd like to welcome each one of you to this very special presentation by Professor um, Ryan Clay Tovar. So before I bring him up to the lecture, I'd just like to say a few words about uh, Professor Clay Tovar. He earned his MA from San Diego State University, California, <laughs> and then he is the very first faculty member to offer comics, art, and graphic novel studio course. And he also spearheaded the development of a minor program, minor degree program in comics art and studio art. And he has many, many awards that he has received. Well, it's really loud there, so I have to speak even louder. <laughs> but um, normally, I would just give long list of his publications. But I'd like to just say that although I just met him about three weeks ago, I feel like I know him really well. I know what his parents think of his art. I know what his childhood <laughs> friends think of his art, what color he would be if they had to pick a color for him, what his girlfriend, ex-girlfriend thinks of him. These are the kind of things that I do not have any way of knowing about our guest speakers, but I do so precisely because I've been reading these comic books, which I purchased at the last Comic Con at the Breslin Center. So that is precisely the power of his comic art, and he's going to share with us how his life journey has brought him to MSU and today right here to share with us all that long journey and what I really appreciate about Professor Claytor's presentation at the Wrestling Center is, is the passion that I felt. I rarely meet people who are so, so excited about what they do. He really lives his passion and, and that passion is driving his artwork so I hope that by attending this presentation and hearing his life story, you will too be touched by his passion and this will lead you to discover the artist in yourself. So with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Clay towards the lecture. Hi. I'm very passionate. I'm just kidding. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. I really appreciate Asian Studies having me to talk about something that I do like a whole lot, which is comics. Um, so I thought I would go over a few things today. One, introduce you to my work, and then move into, uh, oh, do we need this on? Uh, how's that? Uh, test, test, one, two, three. Test, test, test. No, Is that better? Yes. You okay. might not have it in All right. So start out with, with an introduction to my work and move on to the process of how I create my work. And I wanted to talk about mechanics of comics. And I'm saying some because I didn't want to say the mechanics of comics uh, because there are far more than I could cover in this lecture today. And finally, I wanted to make a quick plug for comic studies at MSU. Uh, because I'm very proud of what we've put together here so far. And finally, I'll try to break for some Q&A at the end. So let's get started with an introduction to my work. Uh, I self-published my work under the moniker Elephant Eater Comics. And I know that's a weird name. People ask me a lot, what, why is this called Elephant Eater? Are you really that, do you really have that voracious of an appetite? And it's uh, based on a saying that my dad used to tell me as a kid all the time. He'd say, well, it's like eating an elephant. You just do it one bite at a time, and before you know it, you're done. So I always think about that when I have big tasks in front of me, like going through school or creating books, uh, kind of keep me grounded and pay tribute to the pops, too. Uh, so I first started producing comics around 2004, and this is a uh, picture of the first four mini comics that I created. They were 24 to 28 pages in length, and um, all of them were hand-folded, hand-printed, hand-stapled. Um, Mini comics is a uh, comic book industry word for a comic book that you create yourself. And these had print runs from anywhere between 200 to 800 copies a piece, and when they sold out, to my surprise, people wanted more. So I compiled these four books, and uh, produce them in this collected version, uh, the collected and then one day. And I thought I would show you guys uh, the introduction to this book because I think it serves as a nice artist statement. 
And at the beginning here, you can see this tier of simultaneously successive panels where uh, that's a fancy way of saying you've got a continuous background throughout the panels, but a repeated character to show this passage of time. And as I approach the camera, uh, this is me with a little more hair. Yeah, I say hello again, uh, or maybe for the first time. I'm the guy creating these comics, Ryan, if we haven't met before. This book contains all the strips from the first four issues of my autobiographical comic book series, and then one day. I know, I know, autobio comics, you've seen them, right? Well, I think with these you'll find a little different spin on the daily strip. It's not quite so morose, so riddled with angst and defeatism, which if you haven't read autobiographical comics before, a lot of them are. Uh, not to say the proverbial poop doesn't hit my fan now and again, but the strips in here have a focus on living life and recognizing the details that make our existence worthwhile. Regardless of whether the situation was exhilarating, heartbreaking, or simply quotidian, a lot of these sequences are probably often overlooked in each of our lives, but on closer examination, I think they are what provide the intonation, inflection, and subtleties that make our lives rich. I'm not trying to say these experiences of mine are any more worthy of publication than yours or anyone else's. I'm just an average, quirky guy. But I hope from experiencing this book, it will inspire you to look at your own life with a critical and observant eye, while still being thankful for what it is. I know it did that for me. And this is an example of one of the strips from uh, this book. And I'll read through this real quick. It says, every time I wake up, it seems I immediately wrench myself out of bed and go to work. Today I woke up to the still silence of the morning sun and pondered the fleeting tranquility of this moment, then went to work. So you can see how I was experimenting with panelization at this time. Uh, we've got this democratic grid structure set up where every one of the panels occupies the same amount of space, developing this very regular cadence and rhythm to it. And then on the third tier here, you have this elongated panel that takes up three times the amount of space as anything else on the page. You've also got the text that's set on this curvilinear baseline. And all of this really encourages you to slow down and linger on this panel. And then right back to the democratic grid structure for the final panel. And these strips range from uh, contemplative to humorous to kind of somber, like this one here, the details uh, break up I was going through at the time. Uh, I'll let you guys read through this for a moment. And as we come to this final tier, you can see these panels sort of closing down, sort of like uh, our eyelids were, sort of like the relationship was. Um, and as I moved on, uh, my next book was uh, sort of a hybrid of um, comics and illustrated journal. Uh, during this time, I was uh, launching into grad school and uh, pursuing my MFA studies. And uh, I wasn't sure I was going to have time to work on comics. So I sort of put myself on this exercise to do a drawing each day, followed by some text. I could complete that in about 30 minutes a page rather than several hours a page of comics. And they ended up looking something like this. Um, at the time I was doing this, I was just carrying around a sketchbook with me everywhere I went, to coffee shops, to dinner, to classes hiding them from teachers, just like I did in grade school. And eventually, my grad school, um, uh, my graduate studies professor started seeing what I was doing. They said, what is this? And I told them what I was doing. They said, you need to be doing more of this. Uh, you know, this is obviously what you're interested in. And so uh, I started thinking, well, this is similar in concept. You know, it's still autobiographical in nature. They may not all be comics, but I thought it was similar enough where I created this as my next book, which ended up being about 100 pages. And uh, once the floodgates were open on autobiographical comics for me in grad school, I started work on this next project, which became my sixth book. Uh, and then one day, number six, the autobiographical documentary. Uh, and I was really questioning the validity of autobiography at this time. 
I was doing a lot of theoretical reading about autobiography and thinking about how that relates to comics. And I found this theory which states that autobio is no more truthful or valid than fiction. Which got me thinking, you know, what could I do to make autobiography any more truthful or objective than it already is? So I conducted interviews with a bunch of different people in my life, everyone from longtime friends to new acquaintances since moving to grad school, parents, teachers, and as Catherine mentioned, even ex-girlfriends. And I recorded these interviews, but I didn't conduct these interviews in a face-to-face -face manner because I didn't want to influence their responses. So I made these questions in the form of a box of flashcards and put each person in an isolated room with just a box of questions and a tape recorder and let them have at it. So this book is a result of transcribing these interviews and converting them into comic book form. And they ended up looking something like this. Uh, this is a longtime friend of mine named Rhett, and I never heard Rhett say this before. <laughs> He says, when Ryan first started doing cartoons, I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, you got to be kidding me. Didn't you grow out of that crap when you were 12 years old, like the rest of us? But now that I have his books, I definitely do look at it uh, more as, a, as an art form. I mean, because it's telling a story through art and words. So I think I definitely have more respect for it now than when I first saw it. So as I'm listening to this on tape recorder, it's free kids in the audience. We used to have these things called tapes that made sound. Um, so uh, as I'm listening to this, uh, I'm thinking, okay, this is kind of uh, awkward. But then he gets to this part where he has this like grassroots mind shift about a medium that I'm very passionate about. So to hear that from someone that I'm pretty close to was pretty gratifying. Um, it was also interesting to hear how this project affected different people in different ways. Like, this was a buddy of mine named David, and he says, Ryan's favorite color, I'd have to go with like a navy blue. He seems really even keeled, but light and humorous. Just kind of calming, I guess. Which is in contrast to an ex-girlfriend named Shana, who says, I suppose that Ryan's favorite color is blue. I suppose this because it is a fairly standard color to be a favorite color, and Ryan does not strike me as being a very think-outside-the-box kind of guy. It's a very lovely color, the color of the sky, the color of the ocean, the color of all things great and good, and uh, strikes me as a very Claytor-esque sort of thing to enjoy. So you can see how this took form as sort of a hybrid of autobiography and documentary all at once. Um, you know, I'm still the person creating this book. I'm the one illustrating it. I'm the one who's editing it. I decide what goes in, what gets left out. Uh, but at the same time, I never appear in the book. It's all people related to me talking about me. Uh, so after doing this project, I still had a lot of questions about autobiography that I wanted to discuss with someone. So uh, I set up an independent studies with one of my graduate professors to start making this story arc. Uh, so this spanned the next three books in my autobiographical comic book series. And this took me well past my graduate studies. And uh, in here, I really wanted to explore autobiography uh, and autobiographical theory in a more visual way. Uh, you know, I've been reading a lot of text, and as a visual person, um, you know, it's sometimes difficult for me to wade through large mountains of text. And so I started making some of these ideas on comics pages, like that uh, theory that I mentioned just before. And here I say, so really, I guess you could say autobiography is just a big continuum, ranging from truth to fiction, and there's never any absolute. I don't think autobio will, either, will ever sit on either extreme of the spectrum. It's never pure truth, and on the other hand, it's never pure fiction. So, you know, I'm able to make visual these continuums that I'm talking about, and at the same time, I was also really interested in making this feel like a very authentic experience. Uh, and to that end, I included a lot of the idiosyncratic ums and pauses uh, that were in the character's speech, because uh, again, I recorded our conversation, so I had uh, a very real 
uh, audio recording of how this conversation went. Um, so you can see the hums and the hums as we move through here. And even as I finish up thoughts, you know, I'll look across the table to the professor and when there's not a response given, my eyes start shifting and I grab the burrito in front of me as we're eating lunch and we pan across the table to see the professor finishing up a bite of his own, cleaning up, and then letting loose with his response. Uh, and even into, uh, you know, really trying to get um, realistic with how these responses are given. Like, um, it's kind of a, and then as he sort of searches for this thought and pauses and then lets loose with what he's about to say, uh, all of those things are included. And this is a weird comic book. It's a comic book about autobiographical theory. Uh, maybe it's the only one out there. It's the only one that I know about. Uh, so because of that, I wanted the environment, I wanted the world building to speak to what this comic was about. Uh, so as we walk around campus, as we move from his office to lunch to uh, a stroll around uh, San Diego State University, you start seeing these very quintessentially university buildings and I went back after having moved to Michigan and started taking a lot of photographs of San Diego State University and you can see them directly replicated in a lot of scenes in the book. Uh, even down to, I want to focus in on this panel up here, pull it down for a second, down to these weird pieces of public art that you pretty much only see around university campuses. Um, again, you may not know what this is or why it exists, but it all speaks to the environment in which this book is taking place. And another page of heavy environment and world building. So, as I mentioned, these three books uh, were a single story arc. They were always meant to be in a single collected version. Uh, I released them yearly uh, because I didn't want to just disappear from the comic scene and uh, have people think I wasn't doing anything. So I released them in individual arcs and then compiled them into a single collected book. And when I did, I started duotoning these pages uh, to add a sense of highlighting to the characters and a sense of depth to the environments. Uh, so here's what it looks like now that it's completed and printed and there's even an afterword talking about some of those uh, photographic references that I was mentioning before. Chronicling a lot of these experiences I've had with my young son, and I thought I'd read you one of these here. Uh, this is not released yet, but um, you know, zooming in here, you know, we see my son and I in uh, our old house, and I say, hey honey, look at all that snow, and we look outside together. And he responds, hmm, 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 hmm. <laughs> and we laugh, and the conversation continues. So uh, I'm really excited about releasing this eventually. Um, you know, I'm finally starting to get my artist legs back underneath me, and now that I've got my daddy legs underneath me, and uh, starting to produce some more pages. Uh, and it's also going to be my first full-length, full-color work. So I'm really excited about this. Uh, and this leads nicely into my process. So I thought I'd show you one of my latest pages and what I go through to create a page of comics. So I start out with a very rough uh, outline in Microsoft Word. Uh, you can see uh, the titles up top and then uh, I'm pretty much not even calling out character names and uh, environments because I'm usually the one who's translating this to comics page. If I start sharing pages with other people and start soliciting feedback, I flesh this out a little bit more, but it's pretty rough at this stage. I'm a pretty fast typer, and I feel like I can get my ideas out via my fingers quicker than I can get them out drawing, surprisingly enough. So uh, I started Microsoft Word, and then I moved that script to a uh, vector art program called Adobe Illustrator. And this is a template that I've got set up for my page of comics. Um, so here it is laid out, that same page that you just saw. And over here, all this junk that you see are a bunch of gutters. So gutters are these things between the panels of comics. 
So if I want two equally spaced panels, all I have to do is pull this over and lengthen them. If I want three equally spaced panels, here's a group of gutters that I pull over and put on my page. If I want unequal gutters, you know, if I don't want things that are you know, three up or equally spaced, then I simply ungroup them and move them around once I've got them on my page. Uh, you can even see templates for speech balloons, tails, and occasionally I'll even try to think about where I'm going to put my characters in the panels as I'm creating this. So there's a couple of head shapes here that I can pull over and resize as I need to. Um, I've taught digital art programs for a long time, so these are like extensions of my body. I can't imagine working without uh, digital assistance. Um, and once I'm finished with this, I take the outline and traditionally I would print this out on blue line and start hand penciling in blue pencil. Now blue pencil is used often because uh, when you're scanning this back into the computer and you've got your inks over top of this, the black ink scans as black, the white page scans as white, and you can press a magic button in Photoshop to make all the blue pencils disappear. So essentially, the blue pencil scan is white as well. So you don't have to go through and erase the entire page when you're done with it. But my process has shifted a little bit in recent days, and now I'm doing all my penciling on a tablet. So I've got a Microsoft Surface Pro 4, plug, plug, um, <laughs> and I'm using a program called Manga Studio, which gives you all sorts of uh, layering capabilities. So you can see that every panel I create, I've got a folder for. Here's panel one, panel two, three, four, five, etc. And here is panel six expanded. So I've got a layer for this man, a layer for the background, a layer for me, a layer for my son. Um, so I can move everything around independently uh, until I'm ready to commit to it. So here is the blue line output of that particular page. And once I'm done digitally penciling this, I'll print it out on Bristol, which is like a thick drawing paper. And uh, here is uh, my all-in-one copy machine. <laughs> it prints, it faxes, it copies, and the only thing I do with it is print in blue line uh, because it was very cheap and it prints large format. So uh, since it's top fed, you can feed your paper through it and it comes out looking like this, at which point I will do a few hand pencil cleanups, but then start inking in very short order. Um, and this is actually a different page than the one I was showing you. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because there's a different technique here that wasn't present on that last page that I want to show you. So I'm going to zoom into this environmental panel here. Uh, you know, here we are outside of our old house, and I'm starting to use a program called Google SketchUp, which is a free 3D modeling program. And essentially what I did was I went on to Google Maps and looked at Street View and found a picture of our old house where we used to live. And using this as a photographic <laughs> reference, I started creating in Google SketchUp a model of this house. So it's pretty easy to use once you figure this program out. There's tons of tutorials online if you're interested in this. And essentially you can start drawing boxes and then extruding those boxes and cutting away those boxes and making them different shapes. And once you have a shape that you're interested in, then you can start turning this shape and zooming in and zooming out and getting different viewpoints of this shape. This is simply a box with another box and many more boxes put on top of it. So uh, you can see the comparison that I was working with from the photographic reference. And uh, again, in this model, you can zoom out, you can turn things around, and I decided on the view that I wanted to use. And once I have that, I crop it down to panel size, rip out the color, put it in my pencils, and then start doing some digital pencils on top of that. There it is a little darker, just so you can see it. And uh, these digital pencils are eventually printed out and hand inked and scanned back into the computer. So um, 
I wanted to show you that before moving on with the rest of the process for this page. Okay, so here's where we left off. And uh, I'd start hand inking. And uh, depending upon what it is that I'm inking, I'll use different types of tools. For example, the uh, characters are usually inked with a uh, brush pen. Uh, here's a mechanical pencil with that blue lead that I was telling you about. Uh, there's fixed width pens that I'll use for um, inanimate objects like houses and backgrounds and tables and chairs. Uh, and uh, occasionally I'll even make a mistake and here's my uh, white pen that I can use to color over and uh, clean up some mistakes. And when I'm done, uh, I'll often get people looking at my original artwork and saying, you know, this is so clean, like how do you not make a mistake? And the truth of the matter is I make plenty of mistakes. And what I do, I record them on the side of my piece of Bristol. And when I scan this into the computer, I've got all these notes on the side of my page to go through and fix each one of these things digitally. So here it is, scanned into the computer, cleaned up, and now everything is either black or white. You know, you don't get any of that dirty pencil mark left behind or the texture of the page. Um, it's really a clean uh, looking illustration at this point. And then from there, I'm starting to color my work. Now, this is not a final colored piece. This is what we in comics call flat work. So prior to coloring, you flat your piece by essentially outlining every piece of individual color. And it doesn't matter what colors are in the flat work because the colorist of the piece is just going to go back through and make the colors whatever he or she wants eventually. So uh, this is one part of my work that I've started to hire out. Uh, this is an intern of mine and a former student of mine named Kate. And uh, during her internship, she started getting into this color flatting process and uh, now that she's not my intern anymore, I am uh, employing her to uh, flat my pages for me. And uh, like I said, usually the flats are any old color. It doesn't matter because once you put a color down, now the colorist, i.e. me, can go through and grab a sweater and make it whatever color I want or grab the fence line and make it whatever color I want. A lot easier than going through myself. But because I know Kate and we've got this working relationship, I will specify repeated colors in here. Like, I know what my skin tone is going to be. I know what my glasses color is going to be. I know what my hair color is going to be, etc. So for repeated characters, I'll often go in here and specify colors. So there's another part of the process I don't have to worry about. Because um, again, with increasingly little time, <laughs> being a father and a professor and starting a new program, uh, I need all the time I can get. So here's the finished flats, and here are the finished colors once I'm done with them. So there's how I create a page from start to finish. And I was asked to talk with you guys about the mechanics of comics. So I wanted to go over a few of these. And I mentioned some mechanics of comics here, by no means all of them. Uh, and essentially, we're talking about comic-specific language here. And I wanted to start with environment, and then we'll go into line weight, and finally, panelization. So let's jump back up to environment, which essentially establishes setting, and it does so without the use of words. Now, this panel of comics reads very differently than this panel of comics. You know, this tells you about the environment. It tells you when and where you are. And sometimes environments will even depict mood, which sounds kind of weird, but I'll get into that in a little bit. So whether you are in a quaint Bavarian town or your buddy's backyard digging a hole or the county fair, all of these environments that are illustrated are vitally important to storytelling. Um, you know, they give you information that is not spelled out in words. Okay? That's one of the interesting things about comics is that you can show instead of tell. So I also talked about how environments create mood. So we see here all these warm color choices, this luminous light, the fireworks happening, things are in flight. Uh, there's this upcast gaze of the characters, which are all contributing to this positive, hopeful mood. Uh, likewise here, 
very similar things happening. Uh, this double page spread from Ruse uh, is shot at dawn, which gives this like rebirth metaphor, uh, dawn of a new day, uh, this hopeful um, uh, experience that these characters are just starting on. Um, another double page spread here, and uh, I like showing this page because it's a great contrast between exterior and interior, cool colors and warm colors. And so when you see this, this is a very welcoming environment. Uh, you've got people ushering you inside, uh, the warm tones of the floor, the warm tones of the curtains behind you. It feels very safe. Everyone's uh, sort of enjoying themselves. Uh, and that feeling is heightened by the fact that we've got this exterior, very cold, very cool environment that we just entered from right before. It's this uh, amplification through differences. Uh, and here's a page from Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. And it's not often that you see the Man of Steel looking uh, menacing, but through this environment with these dark clouds and these shadowed figures, he does just that. Line weight is another comics specific language that you might start keying in on as you focus on different comics. Now this is a page from my wedding comic and I'm going to strip back the color here just so we can focus on the line weight here. And let's focus on that top panel. I'll expand this a little bit so you can see it. So one of the ways that line weight gives you information is about depth of field. Where are the characters in the setting? So just like in reality, perspective, objects closer to you are larger. As objects get further away, they appear to get smaller. And the same is true for line weight. So in these close objects, you'll see a uh, very thick line weight. And as they recede into the distance, into the mid-ground, the line weight tends to diminish and all the way into the background where you have some very thin lines. Uh, zooming out into the bottom left panel here, same thing is happening. You can see these foregrounded ducks, very, very thick line weight, and that line weight diminishes as the scene recedes in space. And this is not a new concept. In fact, this is an old etching plate from uh, the 1500s, and uh, they are using very similar concepts that comic book artists do today. In fact, here are some foregrounded figures, and you see this very thick line weight on her arm. Uh, as we recede in space, that line weight gets thinner and thinner and thinner. So I like bringing in these uh, examples outside of comics to talk about comics, uh, because uh, you know, if you just focus on a single medium, it's uh, kind of narrow-minded. Uh, so I encourage my students to sort of get beyond comics to get inspiration for their comics. Line weight is also used to indicate light source. So jumping back to that uh, same etching plate, uh, there's a light source coming from top left. And we know that because as it hits this person's arm, there's a very light line weight up top and a very heavy line weight on the bottom. So inked or etched in this case, uh, very lightly where light is hitting most, and where it is most shadowed, it's inked a lot heavier. And uh, I show my students an example on the second week of class where I will ink a character with a fixed width line. And it's more reproducible than if you were just printing something that was drawn in pencil. But it looks kind of dead and lifeless, kind of sterile in comparison to something that's inked with a variable width line. And you can see the comparison between the two here. So same character, uh, variable width line used by thinking about a light source. So if light source is top left, coming down, hitting things like the top of the glasses, top of the hair, top of the cheekbone, and everywhere that receives that light is inked with a thin line. Conversely, everywhere that's not is inked with that thick line, as I mentioned before. And you'll be able to see that in comics across cultures, whether it's uh, Blankets by Craig Thompson, uh, Bone by Jeff Smith, uh, this is Death Note here, and finally a uh, close-up of a panel from Blankets by Craig Thompson. 
line weight can also be used to highlight important elements. Uh, so back to this page again, uh, and this panel. While these characters are all on the panel, you know, there's multiple characters, this is sort of a background character. He's not important except for the fact that this town is populated. I didn't want it to be a ghost town, so I included another person walking the same path as us. But these are obviously the main characters. The speech balloons are pointing to them. They're the ones talking. Uh, but I wanted you to see them in this large environmental panel. You know, these people are only, you know, what, a 50th of this panel? So uh, I chose to ink them a whole lot thicker than that other guy. So he sort of fades into the background while the thick outline. The same thing was happening here uh, in this environmental panel from Autobiographical Conversations. So in this top panel, this is a university environment, and it's populated by a lot of people. Uh, but which people should you be looking at? The ones that are heavily inked. Another panel with a lot of people, and your eye is drawn straight to these people that are heavily inked. It's a basic art concept that your eye is drawn to the point of contrast. So if you have a big white canvas, and then you put a dot of red ink on there. Where's your eye going to go? Right to that dot. It's the point of contrast. So likewise here, these people are the point of contrast. Finally, I wanted to touch on panelization in comics. And they can increase legibility of how you read. So. Uh, this is an excerpt from a Scott McCloud book called Making Comics, and he talks about how in Western culture we read from left to right, top to bottom, and we carriage return when we're done. In manga, we read from right to left, top to bottom, so it's the same concept, just reversed. So he talks about when you have a panel composition like this, too small into one long, that this becomes kind of confusing, because if you think about it, we read from left to right, top to bottom, and then when we're done, we carriage return and continue on. So essentially, this panel is forgotten about. Or are we supposed to read left to right, top to bottom, and then reverse our direction of read? Like that's really awkward, too. We're not used to doing that. Um, so that seems strange as well. Uh, if we're using a uh, case of manga, it would read the same way. We we're reading from right to left, top to bottom, and then we carriage return. We don't start reading from left to right. It would just be odd. And so, uh, as manga readers, you are probably quite familiar. We read from right to left, top to bottom, and you can see that even in this example from Love Hina, we've got that uh, proper one tall into two small, instead of two small into one tall. So we encounter this panel first and move on to read appropriately. Now, this is an excerpt from a Will Eisner book, um, and it's an excerpt from his uh, comic called The Spirit. And I wanted to highlight this particular tier of panels. And I've read this over a lot of times because it's kind of a confusing read. But after reading this over a whole bunch and talking about it semester after semester, I've come to the conclusion that Eisner intended this to be read, panels one, two, three, four, and then five. But inevitably, every semester I show this to my students, there are alternate ways of reading this. And they are not wrong for finding different ways to read this because let's focus on just this part of it. Um, so initially we read across these tiers, but occasionally I'll get people saying, well, I read one, two, three, four. And it's because there's a lot of elements leading your eye from panel two down to panel four, or maybe this is three. So we've got things like this path of motion line from this guy whacking the spirit on the head. This is encroaching on panel two and leading your eye downward. Likewise, the 
speech balloon. If we're reading left to right, top to bottom through this panel, well, this is a part of that panel. And so we start reading here, and then we see the tail, which leads our eye down here. So there's another element that leads our eye downward. Likewise, the spirit's hat is levitating in the second panel, bringing us downward to that final panel. So maybe this is an appropriate way to read this. Um, or if we zoom out a little bit, um, I've also had people tell me they read one, two, three, four, five. And again, there are elements that lead you from three to five, like the spirit breathing out this cold air, uh, this condensation outside of his mouth that leads to that fifth panel. Uh, also, the fact that this panel is overlapping the fifth panel leads your eye in this direction. Uh, so, all this to say, this, uh, Will Eisner was creating these comics back in the 1930s, and he was one of the first proponents of comics as literature. Uh, consequently, he didn't have a lot of uh, forefathers. He's sort of the, the godfather of comics. Um, he went on to teach at the School of Visual Art in New York City and make uh, some of the first comics uh, instruction books. Um, but during this time, he was doing a lot of experimenting. Some of these experiments worked, and some of them did not stand the test of time. This is one of them that did not stand the test of time. And I think that this is so confusing because if we break this down into a little more simple look, we see that what we've got is this quintessential panelization no-no that McLeod was talking about, that too small into one tall. Okay. So if you're reading a comic, and you're sort of ripped out of that narrative experience, it might not be your fault. <laughs> there might have been some questionable choices made by the artist. Um, panelization can also lend meaning to the narrative, like I talked about in a couple pages from my book I showed you earlier, where it was very deliberate that every panel occupied the same amount of space. I wanted that regular cadence and rhythm. Likewise, on the bottom here, where that panel slowly closes down, as do our eyes, as do, as did the relationship. Um, but there's a lot of other examples where uh, panelization can lend meaning to the narrative. For example, this is a page of newspaper comics done over 100 years ago by uh, an American master of comics, Windsor McKay. And this is Little Nemo in Slumberland. Um, the story is nothing deep. It's uh, about a little boy who falls asleep in the first panel, and he wakes up in the last panel, and the intervening panels are his dreamscape. This happened every week, and there were different adventures in dreamland every single week. So uh, I wanted to read through this with you real quick. And you almost don't even need the words to understand this comic. Um, he falls asleep in the first panel, and even though he's sitting up in the second panel, you know he's asleep because this little guy is there that only appears in his dreams. So as he sits up, his bed begins to grow and grow and grow. And it grows so much that the panels start to grow too. And it starts walking out of the house, galloping around the city, bucking and rearing. It continues to grow and the panels expand to fit that growing bed. So he jumps up on a building, gets tangled in a church spire, topples down, and then little Nemo wakes up. So you can see as the bed starts to shrink, the panels do too. And this is, again, not a concept that fell out of use in uh, the early 1900s. In fact, here's a modern page of Batman by Jim Lee, and you can see the character falling from this very high, tall building. And as he does so, these panels span from the top to the bottom of the page, emphasizing the height from which he is falling. So there's a few things to look out for the next time you are reading comics. And before I wrap things up here, I just wanted to give a few mentions to uh, some comic study stuff we've got going on around Michigan State University. Uh, first of all, uh, I've been uh, on a 
war path to make a comics minor here at Michigan State University for the past several years, and this is the first academic year it is offered. It is now officially on the books. It's called a comic art and graphic novel minor, and it is a cross-departmental minor between art and English. Uh, so there's uh, studio courses, there are literature courses, and there's even portions in the minor where you can tailor your experience to take more literature courses or more art courses to have it more focused on one side or the other. Um, there's also comic art and graphic novel studio courses, which I teach. Uh, I've been teaching an introductory course for quite some time, and next semester I'll be teaching an advanced course for the first time. And in this course, uh, it's currently called STA 191. Um, here's some example work for my students. Uh, they create books by the end of the semester, and at the end of the semester, their rock star final is to head across the street to Hollow Mountain Comics and Games and uh, sign and sell the work they've made over the course of the semester. Another very new uh, happening is the Comic Art and Graphic Novel Podcast. Uh, this just released its first episode at the beginning of the month. Uh, you can find it here at msucomics.lipson.com, as well as every podcatcher site you can think of, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Radio, Intune, uh, podcatchers. Um, and the major part of this uh, podcast is a career-spanning interview with a professional practicing award-winning cartoonist. Uh, our first episode is with Sergio, Ar Sergio Aragones, who is the most awarded cartoonist in history. Uh, I feel very lucky to have interviewed him uh, for that first episode. Uh, and it also talks about uh, comics happenings around Michigan State University. And there's a featurette where we highlight uh, a selection from the Special Collections Library, which uh, incidentally is the largest collection of comic books in the entire world. It sits in the basement of your library and it's accessible to anyone. You don't have to be a student. You can be a community member and come in and take a look at this collection too. Uh, so that's what makes up this podcast. Um, and we've also got an event called the Michigan State University Comics Forum, which is celebrating its 10th year in 2017. Uh, here are some posters from the past. Uh, this past year, we were able to bring Sergio Aragones, who I mentioned, and as I also said, this coming year will be our 10th anniversary. So, uh, I think that about takes us to the end of the time that we have, uh, so I'm going to turn it loose to any questions you might have. Yeah. So when you, I saw you did the, um, your process, it's like both digitally and um, 